Hello, and thank you for tuning in to another Keep Michigan Learning webinar hosted by Michigan Virtual. I'm Dr. Chris Harrington, and in today's session, I'm joined by three instructional experts from Michigan Virtual. Together, we'll share some resources and expertise relating to providing accommodations for students in online learning environments. Before we get started on our topic for today, I wanna to share a webpage with you that hosts all of the recorded learning continuity webinars by Michigan Virtual. These recordings are all freely available and I hope you invest some time to visit the webpage, michiganvirtual.org slash learning dash continuity. I think you'll find a lot of great information for both teachers and administrators alike. Our, printers, our presenters for this session are three fantastic individuals from Michigan Virtual. First, we have Alana Perditas, who's our World Languages Lead Instructor, again from Michigan Virtual. Lisa Rohde, who's the Senior Specialist for Student Programming at Michigan Virtual. And Kristen Cuck, American Sign Language Senior Instructor. So let's get started. Alana, could you please walk us through what we mean by accommodations for students and how that contrasts with modification and differentiation? Sure, Chris. So accommodations are something that would be outlined in a student's IEP or 504 plan. The accommodations will help change how a student will interact and learn the material while meeting the same expectations, objectives, and learning standards as their peers. So these accommodations are going to be decided upon the IEP team for the students. And this is not something that can be confused with a modification or differentiation. Modifications actually go above and beyond providing an accommodation to students, and it does change the end result in which uh, the end result of what students are expected to learn and are required to learn. These students are working on a different path and they are earning an alternate to a high school diploma. This is not the decision of an individual teacher for providing a modification. This decision would be made with a full IEP team and what those modifications will be for those students. Accommodations and modifications do relate directly to these IEPs and 504s. However, differentiation is something that can be used to address all students. So differentiation is more about allowing style and choice for all learners. And this is something that is not going to be required by an IEP or 504, like that of an accommodation or modification. And now we'll go ahead and turn it over to Lisa, who will take it a little bit deeper with providing online accommodations. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about accommodations in the online environment, um, what's inherent in the online environment, and what the teacher in the online environment can provide for students who need those accommodations. We know that there are different types of accommodations that you might see for your students. Um, accommodations for instruction, which would be things like reducing the difficulty of an assignment or changing the reading level of an assignment to better meet a student's needs. Um, accommodations for how the student is responding to their work. Sometimes we'll have students respond orally to assignments or students will use their native language or braille to respond to assignments. Um, accommodations for how students are scheduled to complete their work, extended time on assignments or extended time in testing, um, accommodations for setting, um, where does the student work, how do they take their tests, um, how many students are with them when they're testing or working, and accommodations for materials, um, providing recorded lectures or providing notes are some examples of the kind of accommodations we would see there. Um, one of the biggest discussion points I think in recent days has been about how we can best serve um, our students that need accommodations when we're trying to learn um, via distance learning due to our current, um, our current climate. So on March 21st, um, the U.S. Department of Education released a, a fact sheet that talks about um, specifically how we can best serve our students with um, so on March 21st, the um, U.S. Department of Education released a, a fact sheet that talks about how we can specifically serve our students who need um, accommodations while we're trying to learn via distance learning. Um, the biggest takeaway from that document was that um, ensuring compliance with IDEA or um, Section 504 
should not prevent schools from offering educational programs to students through distance education or distance instruction. Um, the US Department of Education recognizes that these are strange times that we're living in and they are going to be flexible, flexible when they can be. Um, and that they really want schools to remember that um, the provision of FAPE can include um, special education and related services that are um, provided differently than we might see in a traditional school environment, including virtually online or telephonically. Um, schools should note though, the biggest concern is for the safety of our students and of our staff. Um, they want the schools to note that it would be unsafe or unfeasible to provide hands-on um, accommodations at this point. We wouldn't want to meet with students face-to-face -face for physical therapy, physical therapy or occupational therapy or other language services, but we can provide lots of accommodations for students online um, that would be an extension of their time on assignments, providing videos with, act with accurate captioning, um, providing accessible reading materials, conducting speech and language services via video conferencing, et cetera. Um, but really they want to encourage that parents and educators and administrators are working together to meet the needs of the students, even if the way that those accommodations are provided are different from what we would see typically in face-to-face -face schools. So when we talk about these types of accommodations, um, a, a visual way to think about it would be three buckets. You've got bucket A, where those are the accommodations that would be inherent in your online environment. Bucket B are gonna be accommodations that we can provide in an online environment and bucket C would be accommodations that we just couldn't provide on at an online setting. So when we talk about each bucket, bucket A are those that are inherent in the online environment. Those are gonna be that students can use notes on tests, students receive frequent feedback from their instructors on their assignments. They have the ability to resubmit assignments after reviewing that teacher's feedback. These are all some accommodations that we already have in place in our online environment. When we talk about bucket B, things that we can provide on the online environment, we're talking about extended time on tests, um, that students can take assessments a certain number of times, reduction in the length of um, certain writing assignments or math problems, having that closed captioning for the hearing impaired students on videos, um, and then even assessments, assessment read alouds. We thought, you know, we could do this doing screen reader tools using Zoom. We could partner up with parents and they could work with their student or the school to do these read alouds. So that would be things that we can provide in an online environment. Bucket C, unfortunately, are things that we just can't provide in the online setting. One of the biggest ones, I think, when Lisa talked about it was that occupational and physical therapy. Those are just, it's just something that we can't provide at this time. Um, an alternate test setting. Students getting a copy of their peers' notes um, and that tactile sign language instruction. So these are things that cannot be provided in, in the online setting. So when we talk about these accommodations, it's important that we also think about how, we, how we're going to track our accommodations and the services provided to students. Lisa, could you tell me a little bit more about the tracking? Sure. So when we think about maintaining a log of the accommodations that we're providing to students, this is really important um, for a couple of reasons. We like to know um, what students are doing in this time away from the brick and mortar buildings, but also this is gonna be very, this to be critical for helping us develop new goals for next year's IEPs and 504s um, and, and keeping track of what we're doing for students to aid their learning during this time. So you wanna track things like what accommodations are provided, um, what communications you're providing around those, those accommodations and other information that would be pertinent to the student's special needs. We have this um, document that will be um, available for you linked in um, the Learning Continuity website. Um, and this is just a sample of what you could do in a very simplistic form that would just allow you to track the name of the student, the accommodations that you're providing for them, and um, the date that you did that, just so that you would have a record of what you've done and what the students used. And this could help you um, in the future when you're um, writing new goals and plans for these students.
Now we're just going to give you a couple of examples and have you think about it if it would be an accommodation or a modification. I'm going to read a sentence out loud, give you a couple seconds to think about it, and then um, show you if it's an accommodation or a modification to kind of test your understanding. So our first one, exempting all speaking assignments in a course. Would that be an example of a accommodation or a modification? This is gonna be an example of a modification. It's in a modification because we are changing what the student is expected to learn. So we're exempting them from some speaking assignments, which is not on the same level as their peers might be. So it'd be a modification. How about this next one? Removing a time limit and or the automatic submit setting. So probably something like assessments. Accommodation or modification? This would be an accommodation. And the reason being, we're not changing what the student is expected to learn or produce. We're just allowing additional time for the student to process and think. How about allowing a student to use a calculator on all assignments and tests? Would this be an accommodation or a modification? This is gonna be another example of an accommodation. It's an accommodation because we're changing how a student learns the material. And our final question, adjusting a rubric to have fewer required elements, accommodation or modification? This is a modification because we're removing elements from a writing assignment, we might be losing some of those required objectives or standards and now we're modifying the curriculum. Fantastic. As we close out today's conversation, let's highlight some key takeaways for our viewers. Alana, Lisa, Kristen, could you each please share some key concepts or thoughts that you feel are important for our viewers to walk away with from this presentation? Absolutely. So the first one is just really understanding the difference between an accommodation and a modification. Both are outlined on a student's IEP or 504 plan, but the accommodation allows the students to still learn and meet the expectations of their peers. Um, understanding the U.S. Department of Education stance on providing services to special needs students in our current climate. Um, the Department of Education is encouraging schools to work with students and parents to continue to provide appropriate services where face-to-face um, -face contact isn't necessary to continue to um, work towards students' IEP goals for the year. And then understanding those different types of accommodations, those three buckets, the bucket that you're already inherent in the online, online environment and those which can and cannot be provided in the online setting and what examples fit in each bucket. And really understanding the importance of tracking the accommodations that are provided for students. Um, this helps you maintain your records and also is helping you form um, you know, good assessments about what the student's doing during this time away from the brick and mortar building. Well, on behalf of all of our viewers of this webinar, I wanna thank each of you for sharing your time and your expertise. I know this is a really busy time for you um, and taking some time out to, to share some of this is extremely helpful for everyone. Thank you so much. Once again, before we go, I'd like to remind everyone that we do have that learning continuity webpage at Michigan Virtual, and it provides a lot of resources to help teachers and school leaders shift to remote learning. The two things that I'd like to point out here are these learning continuity and teaching continuity readiness rubrics. Um, they're great for school leaders and for teachers to assess where you are as a school system or as a teacher on in moving to learning continuity in a remote teaching and learning setting. Uh, we also have available uh, through this learning continuity webpage, we have a lot of student content and teacher content, professional learning content available um, that you can use. Um, so check that out. Um, I think you'll find a lot of value there. Um, and as I mentioned before, we do have this entire webinar series available and accessible through the, the learning continuity website. If you haven't done so already, I also encourage you to join our Facebook page. It's our community of practice where we have over 2,500 educators uh, as of this particular recording um, 
all exchanging different thoughts and ideas about how to not only survive, but thrive in a remote learning environment. So um, be sure to check that out. And um, you know, as a community, um, please go ahead and contribute as much as you're willing to, but, but certainly take as much as you need. And then one final piece here on this particular learning continuity webpage is the uh, learning continuity. It's a, it's a planning guide that is available to school leaders. And it's um, all the considerations that school leaders need to think about as they're making a shift from teaching in a traditional face-to-face -face environment now into a remote learning environment. So feel free to, to look at that as well. So we would love to continue the conversation with you even beyond this particular webinar. Uh, if you have any questions or if you'd just like to chat about this topic or others that relate to teaching and learning in remote or virtual learning environments, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Again, I'm Chris Harrington and my email address is charrington at michiganvirtual.org. You can also reach me through Twitter um, and um, or, or reach out to Michigan Virtual as a whole. Um, and my Twitter ID and Michigan Virtual's Twitter ID is also listed on this particular slide. So thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to spend with us and we sure hope that this helped you and um, we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Take care.